Still with us here on our team. Two years on from the fall of Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, the euphoria of the revolution has all but gone. Today, armed militias and Islamists rule much of the country, fighting over territory, smuggling routes and shares of dwindling oil revenue. To top that off, a desperate government is quietly reactivating Colonel Gaddafi's feared surveillance apparatus, using it to hunt down dissenters. RT's Palaslea reports on the sobering anniversary. Anniversaries are often a time of celebration. But two years on, Libya has precious little to be applauding. I'm not sure it will be right to assume that there's a government in Libya. There's no army, no police. Armed militias are in control. There's violent chaos. Militia violence stalks the land. Jihadist groups are growing. Strikes threaten to cripple the oil industry and economic stagnation is everywhere. With all the bad negative things that there are to say about dictators, they are controlling by force the situation in these div divided countries. Libya post Gaddafi is far from the heady days of the revolutionary euphoria. Human Rights Watch says a wave of assassinations has killed dozens of politicians, activists, judges and members of security agencies. All we hear uh, is very um, very troublesome because uh, we hear about uh, clandestine detention centers, uh, uh, detention centers that are run by militias that are not accountable to anybody. These armed militias reportedly have more power than the government, turning the country into a new hub for Islamic extremism. Over the past few weeks, three new al-Qaeda camps have allegedly opened in the south. Libya is becoming the main base for al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. We also know that as a direct result of the Libyan intervention, that the civilian government in Bamako, Mali, was overthrown in the north of the country, and certain Islamists took over, creating a humanitarian disaster, leading to tens of thousands of internally displaced persons, not to mention tens of thousands of refugees fleeing into Mauritania, fleeing into Burkina Faso, basically creating a morass. And if that's not bad enough, the much-promised constitution has failed to materialize. Politicians are deadlocked over the role of Sharia law and bitter regional rivalries. Libyan society consists of Arabs, Berbers and Tebu, so the constitution should represent all segments. And if any group is ignored, then this means exclusion. The Berbers, who make up 10% of the population, are threatening to take up arms against the government. There is a real danger that Libya may break up. You've had a severe problem in Libya with regard to the darker-skinned nationals of the south of the country not being accepted as equal by those who are lighter-skinned in the north. And the deteriorating economic situation isn't helping. Commercial banks are closing their doors in protest against recurrent armed robberies. In a desperate attempt to keep a grip on things, the new government is reportedly using methods that were popular during Gaddafi's time. Libya's transitional government has quietly reactivated the surveillance technology it inherited from the Gaddafi regime. It uses it to track the mobile phones and online communication of Gaddafi loyalists. The two regimes, it seems, are not that different after all. Except that oil production is down, with Libya unable to promise crew deliveries next month as on-off strikes paralyze its major sea terminals. Two years on, many are asking, was it worth destroying Libya to get this broken state? While it's not clear who won, it definitely doesn't seem to be the Libyan people. Paulus Lea RT, Tel Aviv.